Commissioner, we're ready to go whenever you are. Okay. Uh, oops. Uh, I think I just lost the picture. Oh, there we are. Okay. Um, let's uh, proceed to call our first meeting of the year for the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center Joint Conference Committee to order and uh, ask that uh, you, Secretary, will please call the roll. Sure. I'll start with you, Commissioner Chow. Uh, present. Commissioner Green. Present. And I will read the land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Health Commission acknowledges that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. We can move on to the um, second item, which is the approval of the December 12, 2023 uh, JCC minutes. And uh, if I may, Commissioner Chow ask for several um, corrections, which I have in front of me. Um, yes, so. Um, one um, is on page one, um, item three, uh, second sentence. Um, Ms. Moore noted that the bulk of regulatory monitoring has been instead of from the 4A staff, it should be on the 4A nursing staff. And then um, the other comment, unfortunately, I didn't, here we go. Just one more correction, give me a minute. I apologize. I thought I had this organized better. It, it, it's okay. It's on page 28, Mark. Oh, thank you, sir. And uh, it was uh, in the section under the medical staff report that I asked oh, right. to change the wording, Commissioner Chow, from gave to um, express expressed his support. Right. And, yes, so the sentence on page, it's actually page 26 under Commissioner Comments. Oh, the sentence should read, oh, no, I apologize. Uh, Commissioner Chow is it will now read express his support of the doctor as an ex chief of the uh, department of pediatrics. So those are two corrections and thank you for your patience and finding them me finding them. So a motion to accept the minutes are in order. So moved. And I would second and do we have public comment? There's no one on the line. So I will do a roll call vote commissioner Chow. Yes. And commissioner green. Yes. Yes. Great. Um, let's move on to the regulatory affairs report. Good afternoon. Uh, I have what I will call a, a relatively uh, streamlined report. I, I could frame it if, if I was being candid with you that we've, we've gotten it cleaned up and most of the items reported in anticipation of uh, kind of expanding it back out once we have our survey. So there has not been any major movement on our pending survey list. Um, every Monday, Tuesday, we are anxiously awaiting joint commission. Um, I thought they honestly might have been here a couple weeks ago, so we're just, it'll be every Monday, Tuesday till our window closes, which is uh, May 7th. So we do anticipate they will be here shortly. Uh, Commission on Cancer is also uh, well underway with the preparations for that. So that is scheduled on March 28th. And lastly, the other one we have a date on is our Joint Commission Lab Survey window opens uh, at the end of March, and that is a three month window. So sometime between March and June, we would anticipate them, though that is a survey where sometimes they may come slightly beyond that window. Um, during the month of December, there was no survey activity to report, no plans of correction submitted, and, and no monitoring to report. But I do have on the second page our CDPH uh, reported cases. So uh, in December, there was one hospital acquired pressure injury and one medication uh, related adverse event. And that brought us to an, a grand total for the year of 49 events, which is roughly in line with 2021. So based on uh, the three years of data that we've um, been able to compile, I would say I'm, I'm happy to report that we've kind of gotten back down to that a little bit more stable level around 50 rather than the almost 70 that we had in 2022. Um, so with that, I will open it up to questions. Good, uh, Commissioner. 
Well, I would just say with an institution of the size and complexity to have so few of these fries and reports is quite remarkable. Congratulations. And this is this is really incredible when you think of the number of touch points. So thank you. Thank you. I, I I would also agree and and I'm glad to see the privacy breaches are also uh, coming down uh, from, um, you know, um, your um, previous uh, 18s and all. So uh, I, I was wondering sometimes, uh, of course, we well, we still have the number of hospitals that need to be surveyed in the city. Do, do you have any idea in the city whether uh, the Frank Commission has announced to them whether they're going to have surveys? You know, we, we really have no sense at this point when they might come. Our, our hypothesis from a, a conversation we had last summer with them when they kind of finalized our uh, application was that given CMS's recent push to hold uh, accrediting organizations such as Joint Commission and DNV accountable, that they were not to be telling us the morning of the survey until they actually were physically on campus and also that they were not to honor any blackout dates we requested. Uh, that we were again anticipating this might happen in January or February. I would say from a survey prep standpoint with the staff, we really have been out on the units uh, trying to kind of spread the message. Um, and I think we've, I don't know if we've gotten to everybody, but we certainly have been spreading that message as far and wide as we possibly can. I have an employee that actually is spending the evening in the hospital just trying to get to night shift, for example, uh, tonight. And, you know, with that, I think we are kind of, we, we really don't know is, is my direct answer to that, um, but we're continuing to prepare and I think are gonna be moving kind of with our preparation activity to sort of some, some form of uh, su sustaining it rather, uh, given that they could show up any day between now and May 7th. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Um, was there a public comment? Oh, you said nobody was on the line. Oh, well, actually, uh, one person's arrived since I made that statement. So, a uh, person on the line, we are on item three, the regulatory affairs report. If you'd like to make comment, please press star three. Oh, actually, uh, I need to back up. Um, any public comment, re any remote public comment would have had to have been requested through an accommodation request uh, for disability by noon yesterday. So um, unless we have someone in the room, then we will not be taking remote public comment. That is the new rule as published on the agenda and announced in the email and website. So I believe we can move on to item four. Okay, please. Uh, sure, an overview of the ZSFG strategy to improve workplace violence. And I will pull up the, would you like me to pull up the? Please do, thanks Mark. Sure. Great. Good afternoon uh, and happy new year, commissioners. Uh, my name is Andrea Turner and I'm the chief operating officer at ZSFG. It is my pleasure to update you all on our strategic plan, safe and equitable staff experience with a focus on workplace violence prevention. While I am the owner, uh, the executive sponsor for the strategic plan, uh, you can only imagine that it takes us all in mighty Army to do this work. I would like to thank my partners in this effort, the KPO team, uh, particularly uh, Jason Victoriano, Chris Ross, Will Hewen, and their fearless leader, Hemel. I would also like to thank my co-chair, uh, Adrian Smith, who um, supports in the assault governance as well as the uh, Workplace Violence Prevention Committee. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to answer uh, Dr. Chow's question around comparison data. So we started this journey back in 2021, and, uh, and at that time we had the unusual occurrence, the UO system. And unfortunately, that UO system did not have reliable data. So you can't compare the data from the UO system to the safe system, so with that, there is nothing to compare. However, um, in 2024, we will have data that we can compare to 2023. So I look forward to um, having that data presented to you all. As a reminder, I wanted to share with you again the background as to why the focus is on workplace violence prevention. So nationally, healthcare workers are four times likely to experience workplace violence than any other industry. 
a compelling fact is that healthcare organizations need to focus on, on workplace violence uh, as it pertains to our staff. And unfortunately, um, our, too many of our staff members are experiencing uh, violence at work. In 2020, we began this work. Uh, however, our efforts, like I mentioned, were hindered by unreliable data. However, in 2023, now we have the safe system and we are able to use the safe system, which has been integral to the amazing work that we're, be, we're doing uh, currently. The problem statement is because our staff is getting hurt at work, they do not feel safe. Therefore, until our staff stop getting hurt at work and begin to feel safe at ZSFG, staff's perception will continue to be that ZSFG is an unsafe place to work and will not want to work here. So that is our, our, our um, problem statement. And basically, we've done everything that we can so far to get started in moving the needle from having our employees being um, physically assaulted and harmed at work. Slide two, please. So this slide shares um, with how we, we basically formatted our strategy. So at the very top, you have the strategic plan, which is basically directional setting. Operationally, we're problem solving. And at the unit base level, we're working towards having this all the way down to the frontline staff and for it to be supported. Um, by the the um, by the the executives. So the unit base we have med surge. There are five departments that are high risk, and they are med surge, which is uh, supported and led by Danvi Bakta and Gabe Ortiz, uh, behavioral health center, which is led by Therese Lee, and uh, Psych and PS, which is uh, Andrea Chan and uh, uh, Dr. Leary and the ED with um, Dave Staconis and uh, Dr. Singh and uh, Urgent Care with Merjo and Ron. Um, I want to say a little bit more about that. Um, so with the strategic planning, we're looking at the governance and the direction of setting using uh, the different committees, such as assault governance. And assault governance, basically what we do is have the leaders of those departments come to the, the assault governance meeting and share with us what they're doing internally into their department. So using their review boards and, and basically sharing with us what they're doing and we're able to support them by identifying how we can remove barriers and have resources allotted to them. Operationally, we're looking at the data. So it's all about the feedback of the using the data to determine what the feedback is by optimizing the safe system. Uh, we centralize the ownership of the data analysis and the reporting uh, from QM, quality man management, and then implementing a post-event review throughout ZSFG to make sure that we're all aligned on how we're managing our, um, the uh, process around um, uh, mitigating workplace violence. The other key piece is training and education. And I don't know, Mark, can you flip back to the, the first slide? So on the bottom right, that is our scorecard. And uh, basically everything is green with the exception of the training piece. And, um, but that's a little misleading. So the training is around crisis prevention intervention, which is CPI and we're red, not because we haven't had crisis prevention intervention training. We actually have in, in those five uh, departments. What, we're, why we're red is because we haven't had the recertification um, 100%. And that is something that we're working on with our partners in DET, uh, as well as uh, Director Price, who has been amazing in supporting that effort. Um, and then we're looking at other countermeasures as how we can we can make it green and not having to depend on any one entity. And, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, we've increased uh, BERT response, which is the behavioral emergency response team, who is uh, and that department is led by um, Joan Torres. And 
what Joan has done, she's actually put together a wonderful strategic plan in supporting all the departments with the exception of um, PES. Um, we're looking at uh, med surge, for example, on how to support them. If uh, you can go back to the second slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then we're piloting a concept of embedding BERT into uh, different departments. So as I mentioned about the behavioral emergency response team being embedded, we've already done that with the ED and uh, that turned out to, to actually be a good pilot. Um, we can see the difference in um, having BERT and the, um, the BERT members doing their intervention and de-escalating as opposed to having the sheriffs do the de-escalation. Uh, so that has been going very well and we look forward to seeing more, um, more of that in our different departments. Uh, at the unit base level, uh, I wanted to just share a little bit about how that come, how that works. So in, at the unit, we have a framework uh, that Jason Victoriano has led uh, with the different department leaders where we create a, um, a review board and we have standard work for that. And they are, once a situation happens in their department, they use the tools that we have that is standardized and they work to find out kind of like doing like a mini RCA to determine why did that happen. And they look to see if the principles of the crisis prevention intervention worked or what part of it they forgot to use. And then again, share that with the entire um, team. And that has been uh, going fairly decent, but we want to see that increase more. Uh, the other thing is that we have a different way of how we're communicating now. So instead of just using one mode of communication, we've been looking at um, daily management system. Um, again, working on as we're onboarding new employees into the department that they too get their uh, CPI training. And then of course, using BERT and other screening tools to, to um, again, focus on mitigating the physical assaults with injuries. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is the unit based countermeasure, and this is what they report out on, uh, monthly at the assault governance uh, meeting. So they use their data from, uh, the safe system. So you'll see where there's historical data there, and then they stratify the data and then they can determine whether or not the, the physical assaults were, um, severe or not. And then they, on the bottom left, where it says top contributors, that's when they do a, the more, um, more of an analysis as to how it happened. And then on the lower right-hand corner, that's where they come up with their countermeasures. And when they present this, um, the committee, the, the task force will support them with anything that they need uh, going forward. So this is the tool that we use for reporting. Um, I also wanted to share with you, because this is so important to share, um, slide number four, please. So the results and impact, the first six months uh, of 2023 using the SAFE system, you see the first six months we were experiencing about 5.8, um, 5.8 uh, physical assault per month. And then in the last six months, that average is now 3.5. And I will tell you the, the area in the next slide, you'll see that, next slide please, you'll see the stratification by location. And the areas that are of concern, of course, is going to be in the psych areas, the PES, pod A, 7B and such. And we from an equitable standpoint, we have pretty much poured a lot of resources in those areas to mitigate that. So as we have a safe system now with all the information that is in real time, we can look at that and then determine what resources are necessary that will be applicable to mitigate the, the um, workplace uh, or the physical assaults that we're seeing there. So. That ended up in 2023, at the end of the year, 
we had a 40% decrease in overall for those five departments. Um, but again, a lot more work to be done because our audacious goal is to have zero. Um, so more work to be done. And then um, again, this, the CPI training, um, what I mentioned earlier that we have 100% training, but in the scorecard, you see that it's red. The, we need to do the recertification. So we're working on that and um, hopefully we will have uh, by the time I come back, I should be able to report out that we do have trainers in house that we can do the CPI recertification training, and that's the the um, goal for now. So I'm excited about this work. I think it's it's um, going in the right direction. As I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of partners that are also focused on on this. Um, the directors in those departments are amazing, and they're doing exceptional work. Their teams are fully engaged. Um, and so I look forward to continue to working uh, with them on this. Our next steps will be uh, to continue to engage the high risk departments uh, through assault governance, investigate verbal assault. So we have um, for the last couple of years, we've been focused on physical assaults. And I've heard many times over that verbal assaults are also equally important. Uh, and so we're now working to look at the verbal assaults. What's so cool about uh, the SAFE system is that you can see the breakout of physical versus verbal. So instead of them all being lumped in together, we actually can see uh, the verbal assault. So um, I will be meeting with um, the KPO team and we'll be working on that uh, soon. And then of course, to establish a CPI um, crisis prevention intervention, um, subject matter expert. What we'd like to do is to have an expert embedded into the department. So it could be a nurse that is a subject matter expert in CPI or a technologist or whomever, and um, they will be a part of the team. So to make sure that we, the training doesn't just stop when the training happens, but reinforcement of the training. And then to standardize uh, the review committee process, because it's it's still, we still have some work to be done on standardizing the, um, the review committees within the departments. Um, so that's mainly it that we're doing now and, and it's, it's great. Thank you guys. What questions I can answer. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Green. Yes, well, I want to appreciate this work, and I think the trend you've shown is is really phenomenal. It's such a problem across the country. I mean, New England Journal just said something else about it, and and it sounds like you're not only leading the way with best practices, but hopefully, uh, I hope other institutions can benefit from some of this work as well. I, I I only had one one question. It seems like the bird team has really been kind of a linchpin in a lot of this. When, when it said on this little form, the BERT continues to improve, remain below full capacity and scope, does that mean below staffing or below reaching out? But what, where are we on, on the, the BERT team? Because I, I couldn't understand exactly what you meant. Yeah, thank you for that question. So the BERT team is not fully complemented with their, with their staff. So there are still vacancies. So across the country, there is literally a, a shortage of LPTs, of licensed um, psychiatric technicians. And that's what they need to fully complement their staffing. Uh, so once they're able to fully staff up, we will be able to do some of the things that uh, Joan has actually put in her strategy um, that we could deploy. So that's what that means. And how do you see utilizing your SMEs um, yeah. to kind of backfill backfill the BERT team and, and do you, when do you think you might have a full complement of, of individuals at least to deal with those top three locations? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, part of it is to get our staff accredited. So if, if I'm looking at my SMEs, I would look at having them work with the CPI. Um, so we have the Crisis Prevention um, Institute that actually is the credentialing body. So to have them credentialed to do training. And so we would want them to go through training with them and then have them embedded in those departments. So we've tried that. Unfortunately, um, when COVID happened, 
we lost some, some of them left for, you know, greener pastures, I guess, but, you know, so it is a risk with the SMEs, but having them embedded in the departments, I think is really helpful in getting them to be trained because it's, it's, it's not, it's difficult um, to, to hire. And so I think, you know, again, just making sure that we have uh, people embedded in there. Not only that, I think when you look at the principles, and I forgot how many principles there are with the CPI training, having them being able to identify where we have opportunities will be key in those departments to mitigate it from happening again. So that's one idea. Thank you. You're very Thank welcome. You. Thank you, Commissioner Green. Uh, this is a, a very nice presentation, and I'm wondering, uh, you uh, quoted, and, and it is a spectacularly troubling uh, to hear that healthcare workers have four times the problem of work violence, but we can understand that, especially <laughs> in um, uh, hospitals uh, of the nature of SF General. And uh, do we have a comparison as to our um, experiences with other large metropolitan um, uh, county hospitals? That's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, I could find out. I think, um, well, I will say it like this. There are many hospitals across the country uh, to include some of them right here in, in the city of San Francisco that's reaching out to us as to what we're doing. Um, so, and they, you know, again, not having it as structured as ours. I mean, we've been, uh, Adrian and myself have been uh, at attending different conferences and sharing what we're doing. Um, so we don't necessarily have anyone we can pull on to share what they're doing because they're looking at us as to what we're doing. Um, <laughs> but that's a good question. Um, yeah. Well, I, I was just interested in, uh, because I think, I think uh, um, rightly they are uh, looking at you for looking at the structure that you're putting together and, and one violence is too much, of course. I agree. But, but it would be interesting to try to understand like at Highland or um, down in LA County or something, what they are experiencing um, and, uh, you know, and, and therefore at what level uh, we think we can get to. I mean, I mean zero is um, a, an admirable goal, but we, we know that can't really be uh, achieved as uh, easily as, as we can say it. But it would be nice to know that um, per number of, um, you know, patients that are seen or patient days, uh, how much uh, violence, uh, you know, that we are experiencing and they are experiencing something like that just to uh, get a feel as to uh, the uh, breadth of the problem and how well we are doing. Yeah, I agree. So, um, could you also explain on your stratification, which is very interesting, um, and I understand PES, but why would pod A versus pod B be uh, so different? I think that's where um, we have our, um, when our psych patients come in or patients that may be experiencing a psychiatric break, oh, okay. they would go there. All right, that, that would certainly explain that. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and I see, uh, are any of these uh, 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 awards uh, not the ICUs then? Is that right? No, no. The five areas that we're focused on now is um, there are uh, the ED, PES, psych, uh, med surge, and um, BHC, as well as urgent care. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, very good. Uh, we'll uh, anticipate uh, even better reporting and uh, better results uh, yes. as uh, uh, the year goes on. Thank you for uh, your hard work. Thanks, Commissioner. Ciao. Okay. All right. So we move on to the next item? Yes, please. Item five is the ZSFG Chief Executive Officer's Report and Emergency Department Newsletter. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Susan Ehrlich, CEO. 
I'm happy to present uh, the report for this month. And um, it's a very nice segue into the first item, which is um, our award-winning programs at CSFG, one of which was the BERT team. Uh, back in December, um, we won a statewide award uh, through the California Association of Public Hospitals for the Equity Award. And um, the reason that this was um, given the Equity Award, um, it could have been given a Quality Award or any other number of awards, but um, the beginnings of the BERT team um, were because we were experiencing disproportionate use of force against black African American men by the Sheriff's Department. And um, it was that experience that uh, led us to develop BERT as a pilot project and then now as a full-fledged program at CSFG um, because we were very devoted to um, not just wanting to reduce, we, obviously we wanted to address this problem that was uh, very significant, which was disproportionate use of force against black African American men, but it was also a bigger problem um, that we recognized that we were dealing with the issue of violence too late. And what BIRD is all about is about identifying situations early and addressing them before they even happen. Um, and it has um, been wildly successful with that um, through, um, it's not just the activations with being called to a place, but also through its consultations. And you can see the statistics here. Um, use of force was reduced 24% from the previous year um, and degrees for all races and ethnicities. 94% of the team's activations were deemed successful through verbal de-escalation and 84% were completed without law enforcement involvement. Uh, so this is a successful program. I can say that it is a state and national model. Um, it's, uh, it really is where all hospitals and healthcare systems need to go uh, in order to reduce um, this terrible statistic we're aware of, which is that uh, healthcare workers are four to five times more likely to experience violence than, than other workplaces. So that was um, a great uh, acknowledgement that the BERT team got at the state level and at the national level, um, our, the work of our uh, cardiology team was recognized um, in the uh, America's Essential Hospitals uh, report about novel hospital initiatives to target cardiovascular disease disparities. And Dr. Chow, you asked a little bit about what this care pathway does. And um, you, you mentioned that it might, be, um, it might be nice to hear more about it in a subsequent uh, uh, meeting. And that's probably true because I'm going to tell you a little bit about the quick care pathway. It is a, um, this is uh, a novel and important use of artificial intelligence at ZSFG campus. Um, and essentially what it does can be described as predictive, using predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. Um, and it is, um, it is not the only thing that um, DPHIT is doing in, uh, with using AI, um, but it is um, novel and important, especially in this, in this population. So basically what it does is um, it, 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 it uses EPIC and it uses the data in EPIC um, first to identify patients with heart failure who enter the hospital. So it's not left to chance. Um, there, because uh, we want providers to, to either, if, if, that, if that problem is identified as a primary problem or one of the problems, we want pro providers to address it when patients are in the hospital. So um, it identifies the patients, and then um, that's the predictive part of it, and then it helps clinicians actually provide um, uh, education and interventions based on uh, best practice treatment guidelines. So for example, depending on the extent of heart failure in the patient, EPIC will present appropriate medications for the patient to be prescribed through goal-directed medical therapy. And then when the patient is ready to be discharged, depending on what other issues come up for the patient, for example, substance use disorder uh, or housing insecurity, it will recommend to the provider to ensure that those, um, those issues are addressed. And we've seen really phenomenal results with this program. When the program started in 2018, we were one of the worst performers with heart failure readmissions in the state. This was in 2018. 
and there was uh, a significant disparity between black African American men and everyone else. And um, after five years of putting this pathway in place, we're now the best performer in the state, you know, with comparison organizations being safety net hospitals. And we have not just eliminated the disparity, but we've reversed it. So black African American men do better on heart failure readmissions than, than everyone else. But for everyone, it's come down. So it's quite a, uh, a phenomenal um, piece of work that they have done. Um, it, there's a lot of technical details around how they use um, the medical record to identify the patients and to understand what the risks are for any patient. So it probably um, would benefit from another, another presentation, but I wanted to at least give you the basics of how this works today. And then um, last but not least, we had our 37th annual Dudley Perkins Toy Run and Pediatric Toy Drive. This is a great example of an organization that has been so dedicated to the services that we provide um, that they're willing to come with a big group of people on motorcycles in the rain <laughs> to um, provide support for the pediatric work that we do at the hospital. Um, and this whole thing was started uh, 37 years ago by uh, Thomas Perkins, who was brought to our hospital and to our trauma center after a motorcycle injury. And so it carries on today. Uh, any questions about that before I go into the data? No, I want to thank you for that uh, discussion about the uh, uh, congestive heart failure. And, and I think with so much uh, happening with AI, much of it with uh, uh, perhaps uh, less uh, knowledge and uh, uh, it might be good, as I had uh, mentioned, to uh, make a uh, more uh, um, explicit uh, presentation as to how it's used so that we can all feel more comfortable about it. So, uh, Yes, and I think that should definitely involve Eric Raffin um, because he's done a lot of thinking about um, principles and governance for AI in general um, in the Department of Public Health. Um, and um, through the Information Governance Committee um, that we have, uh, we're, we've just launched uh, an AI subcommittee um, that will be looking at you know, practices and governance and um, the way that we roll it out on campus. This is just a very small piece of what overall is envisioned. There are much more kind of common uses of AI that are about to be rolled out, for example, um, provider inbox responses being suggested ambient notes is one that I'm particularly excited about. Um, so things that will help us in the workplace um, reduce unnecessary work. Uh, Commissioner Green, do you have, uh, uh, I, I think this is an important topic because AI is now arising uh, with some notoriety in terms of its acceptance in medicine. What, what, what would you think uh, would be good for the commission to be able to uh, understand? I think it would be fantastic even for a commission meeting to present this. And one of the things I'd be most interested in is uh, as you look at the benefit, how much of the benefit for readmissions is being accrued because of medications being suggested when you have a pretty sophisticated team of doctors and how much is incorporating the social determinants? Because that, that to me is such a critical component. And if somehow we can use AI to really target those aspects of, of um, individuals who fail at home, imagine how we could template that across so many other different diagnoses. So that I think would be of great interest, both from an equity perspective, but also across the board, including including you know how we might do that uh, at Laguna Honda. There, yesterday, there, okay, I get the Wall Street Journal, I'm not conservative, but I do subscribe. And there was a huge section yesterday about uh, artificial intelligence and a, a very big discussion among someone like Eric Raffin and uh, a sophisticated physician, another person about AI and medicine. And they were a little less encouraging. I, I was kind of surprised, especially when it comes to patients getting information and how in the same way in law, they can make up cases that don't exist, that we have to be very careful how we utilize it. But I also can see a lot of opportunity for us, especially if you're gonna pioneer this, where is Epic like giving us a financial break if we're going to make, you know, so utilize these things or be a, a test case where they might be able to then, you know, sell the, the um, utilization to other hospital systems. So I wonder if we're also thinking in this 
budget constrained, um, I'm sure you are in this budget constrained world, whether if we're going to pilot these things uh, and show this kind of efficacy, whether, you know, it can result in some funds for us. Yes. So again, I, I, I think Eric Raffin, bringing Eric Raffin in to talk about these things is really important. And one thing I've learned from Luke's work and from spending time talking about this with Eric is that if you're going to use artificial intelligence appropriately and correctly, it takes a lot of time and effort because these models and what Luke Zier's work has done, he's literally used, you know, thousands of variables to try to find the ones that most accurately predict outcomes for our patients. Mm -hmm. it, it takes time and a lot of knowledge uh, for how to do that because if you use these models out of the box from Epic, for example, they can really lead you in the very wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of time, money, expertise, and thoughtfulness. Um, I, I was just wondering, I see Dr. Fuentes Affleck is on, uh, what the university is doing in terms of AI. I've been emailing with her, so I know that she's on. Let me see if I can email her back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I see she, on this screen, her name is just, uh, you know, four times bigger than everybody else's. At the no. <laughs> uh, I'll mute her and see. She's having trouble with her camera. Let me oh. see if I can. <clears throat> It'd be I'll really interesting. Says, like, I, I've unmuted you. Uh, can you talk? Are you able to speak? I can talk. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you, could you repeat the question? I was a little following well, all we... the technical things. Could you repeat? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Ehrlich just gave a presentation regarding the cardiology team and the use of AI and the reduction in uh, about at least 10% of congestion mm -hmm. failure. And uh, the fact that also we reversed uh, the uh, disparity amongst the black uh, African Americans uh, from the last five years. Uh, so this is a wonderful use of AI. And I was wondering if the university's other uh, departments and elsewhere were also, uh, you know, working at this uh, uh, to, to make uh, uh, use of AI in a clinical fashion like this. Got it. Thank you for rephrasing. There is a lot of activity going on within the university. There's a whole um, center on digital health and some of that is infrastructure. Dr. Tool Butte is also working on big data science across UC systems. And the focus of the School of Medicine Leadership Retreat, which will be in early February, is on AI. And one of the things we will be contemplating there is now that we're learning more about some of the limitations about various forms and various generations of AI, how do we approach it so that we can benefit from it, but not allow it to introduce a whole new set of biases, which we know that that it is capable of. So there's a lot going on there, and um, I don't have any particular updates to present at this point, but I will certainly keep my eyes open for that and will share as appropriate. That's very nice. Thank you uh, so much for uh... For that and, and for understanding uh, and, and for us to understand uh, the more positive sides right now of AI as, versus what we're reading in the press. So, thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, let's go on, uh, uh, Dr. Ehrlich, with the uh, remainder of the presentation. I will. Okay, so starting with the emergency department, you can see the volume uh, slowly ticking up. Um, it is predictable at this time of year for the volume to be particularly high. Um, this shows an average, I think, of 187 in December. Um, in January so far, we're routinely seeing days um, well over 200 patients. Um, so it is, it is quite busy right now. And um, you can see correspondingly the average daily admissions going up um, slightly as well. Um, that line is definitely ticking up. Um, I want to call your attention to the leave without being seen, leave without being triaged. This is a focus of very dedicated improvement work in the emergency department. Um, and we, I, I think I mentioned here before that we did a value stream um, mapping um, around the triage process. It's, it was the first one that we did since COVID. And that team has been very, very focused on bringing this number down. The ultimate goal is 2%, which is the industry standard. 
We're at about 5% now, um, but you can see it's a, it's a big reduction from some of the highs that we were seeing um, about a year ago. Um, what I really like about this work is not, not just that it's um, data-driven improvement, um, but that there is a lot of staff input that is being gotten through this process. There is a lot of patient input that we're getting. Um, we can actually do surveys of patients um, through, our, um, through our contracted provider, and we can get the information in the moment so we know exactly how our patients are feeling about anything that we're doing at that moment in time. Um, it's really tremendous. Uh, and this, there's a big team that's meeting all the time to try to bring this down, and it's a, you know, it's a really hard time to be doing this improvement work with it being so busy, but they've, they've been quite successful at doing it. Um, ambulance diversion, on the other hand, has been, has been harder. And, you know, we've, we've been studying ambulance diversion. We've come through periods where we've done better or worse. And um, I can say last year at this time, there were really two root cause problems that were driving diversion up. Um, one was staffing in the emergency department, and the other is boarding um, in the hospital of lower level patients. This year, it's really the boarding that's the problem. And we'll talk about boarding a little bit later, but we're doing much better staffing in the emergency department. The issue really is once it gets so full, um, especially when there are so many borders, even if you're well staffed, it becomes very hard to manage. Um, so, you know, for example, last night at five o'clock, there were 100 people in our waiting room. And I don't know if you've seen our waiting room recently, but it is very small, and the, the technical capacity couldn't be more than 20. So it's really, really full and really busy. Um, and I really want to commend the team for all the work they do um, in spite of this really um, you know, difficult circumstance that we're in. Um, urgent care has been a huge partner. Um, even, so, even though you see um, this, this line trending down from ED to UCC, it's, it's, it's quite high. And the, the urgent care center is seeing um, volumes that are typically over 100. The averages that we present to you are a little misleading because the weekend volumes are much lower. But during the day, they're seeing 120, 130. And um, you know, a, a good percentage of those are coming from the emergency department. Um, uh, PES is also full. It's a little, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, it's it's not as dramatic as in the emergency department. There's, there haven't been as many changes there. Um, the admissions look like they're getting better. Um, it's, it's hard to feel that, and the numbers, I will say, are small. I mean, notice that we went from 0. 0.5 to 0. 0.8 on average every day, so these are very, these are very small numbers, and in general, there's, um, you know, there's not a lot of admissions. Uh, moving on um, to the average daily census. So um, you can see that the med surge um, census is high. Um, we are routinely running volumes that are at about you know 120 to 130 percent of capacity. We we predict this for this time of year, um, but our average length of stay has gone up. And again, um, just to make the point that that is driven by the lower level numbers that we're experiencing. Intensive care um, also is predictable for this time of year, and this is what makes the med surge problem more difficult because right now we're experiencing very high ICU um, um, uh, volumes as well. In fact, today we had to open our second ICU. Um, and, uh, we were facing opening the second um, ICU uh, surge unit. I think we might have taken patients to the PACU instead, but we're at that level of volume. So we're really approaching the limits of our physical capacity at the hospital right now. Um, uh, MCH goes up and down. We're still, you know, seeing about uh, around 1,200 uh, babies born a year, which is really nice. Um, census in 7B and C is pretty stable. Um, 4A, pretty stable. And then the lower level of care numbers, um, despite our best, best efforts, really are not going in the right direction. And it's because a lot of the things that we're dealing with are kind of beyond the, um, the limits of what we can control. Uh, 4A, on the other hand, looks much better. And I asked the team, well, why, is, why are the 4A lower levels so much better? And I think what they've been doing is um, really 
trying to understand which patients are going to do well in the environment, which patients have the right kind of, um, which patients will do best in this milieu, which ones, what, you know, which ones have a, have a good discharge plan. And they've been able to do that matching pretty well and keep it, keep it full. Um, COVID is stable right now at a lower, kind of a lower level. Um, and then workplace violence, you can see uh, what Andrew was talking about. You can see really nicely, I think, in this chart, this kind of gradual trend downward um, for the physical assaults with injury um, and all the physical uh, and verbal events. So this is really nice data to see. And of course, we'll be monitoring it very closely as a part of our um, strategic work. I'll stop there and see what questions you have um, on the data. Uh, Commissioner Green. Yeah, well, thank you uh, for this update. I only had really one question. What are the diagnoses that are um, bringing people to the ICU now that COVID has waned? Is, there, is it RSV? And what, what are the main reasons? Um, thank you for asking that question. I myself ask it from time to time. There really isn't any unifying diagnosis. It's just a mix of things um, because it's both the surgical and the medical ICUs. So it's, you know, it's traumas, it's, um, you know, sepsis, it's respiratory illnesses, it's, there's no one thing that's driving the volume. And it, it's very typical um, to see this increase in volume in the wintertime, as you know. Thank you. Uh, in, in regards to uh, Commissioner Green's last question, do you have some feeling as to how then uh, influenza or, or RSV is, uh, uh, you know, being seen in the hospital? We do. We get those numbers every day. Um, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to think about, uh, I don't remember exactly what the numbers were today, but it's, you know, it's something like 14 COVID patients, seven flu patients, four RSV patients. It's like, you know, it's in, in that kind of general uh, magnitude. And um, it's it's been pretty steady um, over the course of this winter. Okay, so so the number of COVID. I mean, if we didn't have COVID, uh, uh, so I guess the question uh, you've answered is that COVID still creates quite a bit of hospitalization. Yes, uh, it's just right. relative to other times when we've had sixty COVID patients. Yes. <laughs> It seems it seems manageable, but you're right. It's still a significant um, reason for hospitalization. Right, and I think a lot of people are kind of now feeling. Uh, at least I hear from the general public. Oh well, it's no more than the flu, and and it's still more than the flu. It's still more than the flu, and and I think those that that sort of proportion of numbers I think shows it. Thank you so much. Uh, it's very helpful, um, and uh, thank you for uh, the very nice report. So. Um, we, Thank you. We can move on to our next uh, item. Then. Thank you. Sure. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Ehrlich. Uh, item six, excuse me, is a ZSFG hiring and vacancy report. Hi, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, Emma Perez, clinical hiring team um, with the ZSFG human resources report. So as uh, so you can tell, the hospital vacancies are inching along slightly decreasing from 9.20 as of December compared to 9.91 in November. We've hired a total of 10 employees in that month in various classifications, including RNs, and had nine separations during the same period, of which four were retirements. Um, it was a slower month. Um, we know that during the holidays, it does slow down considerably. We had a lot of staff, uh, hiring managers who were out, as well as um, the candidates who are also, you know, maybe out on a uh, holiday as well. And so it's just uh, not a great time for, for hiring um, in, in a lot of cases. So to mitigate um, challenges with hiring, our RN vacancy rate decre decreased to 7.0. Um, we continue to hire uh, per diem, so we hire two per diems um, to fill gaps. Um, we also had a goal of hiring approximately 63 um, to fill 63 vacancies um, in December to start in February or sooner. 
And as of today, again, with that slowdown, we have um, 34 that are either onboarding or a request to hire has been submitted and the rest are still in selection process. So we're about halfway of, of our goal for that um, time period. HR also continues to work with nursing leadership on a strategic plan for our in hiring um, to establish that regular cadence and for the selection and hiring process. We've met a couple of times with them and we're making uh, good progress towards establishing a more uh, sustainable process that could happen on a regular basis. Um, we're also working with the new people data and process improvement team to develop more comprehensive RN reports, some of those which um, you're seeing now with our new um, RN um, uh, area, vacancy area reports. Um, and we also meet on a weekly and monthly basis with hiring managers throughout um, DPH to review hiring plans and status of positions. Uh, so as far as RN hiring status updates for emergency care, we have 13.9 FTE vacancies um, with six selections made with start work dates in January and February. Um, you had asked a question about whether that 13.9 uh, FTE included the selections. Um, it does not, so it's really 13.9 minus the six selections. Um, our system doesn't capture those uh, those selections that are made until they've actually started working. So it does, it won't be subtracted in the system until they're actually um, they've actually started. For critical care, we have 7.1 FTE vacancies with six selections made with target start work dates in January and February. For med surge, we have 33.2 FTE vacancies with 13 selections made and start work dates in January and February. For OR, we had 2.9 FTE vacancies with two selections made with start work dates in February. Um, so as far as training cohorts, the critical team is pretty much um, filling all of their vacancies. So until they have more vacancies, they um, will make another training program available. But right now, um, they're set to go with their vacancies. Uh, with the emergency care training program, um, they started a program, a cohort, in, on January 20th, and they have another one set to um, occur in April with a cohort of up to 10 in each of those. Um, for the next med search training program is anticipated in February, and they're going to have staggered work dates through March and April uh, with a cohort of up to 30. And our OR training program is targeted for March with a cohort of up to three. Um, we've had other hires besides our ends, as you can see some examples, one 2920 medical social work, worker, two 2587 health workers, and uh, 12430 medical evaluations assistant, one 2322 nurse manager, and seven 2908 senior hospital eligibility workers. That's our report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Green. Thank you. I, I was wondering if you could um, explain a little bit on the math on the uh, emergency care training versus the vacancies. How many people actually are in the January 20, 20th cohort? For the emergency care training program, they actually ended up with six um, in the cohort. And again, they selected, um, they made all their selections, but again, Candidates were not able to make that date, and so they wanted to push out, in some instances, their start work date. So they're going to be pushed out to the April cohort. So they, they ended, up, ended up with six out of the ten uh, for the April, um, January cohort. And then how does that interface with the actual number of vacancies? So uh, the vac yeah, thank you. The vacancies that are reported in the, on Section 4 are a combination of training and experience positions. So it could include... Um, training positions, it could include experienced positions, just depending on the hiring manager's needs. It, um, in a lot of cases, they hire the experienced nurses, and you know, if they can't find the experienced nurses, then they will convert those positions to training. So it's kind of a dynamic situation where they could convert positions at any time. And would you ever be in a situation where you actually have more people to go through the training than there are positions available in the emergency department? I know that sounds weird, but I, I mean, and, and do any of these people going through training end up not being full time? In other words, in terms of, of the cohorts that you're training and, and where they're ultimately placed? 
So for um, the training, it just depends on the area, but for emergency care, um, all of the positions, training positions are 0.9 positions. So they're basically full-time, um, consider them, full, uh, they're still considered part-time, but it's really, you know, 36 hours a week. Um, and for the emergency department, they are um, bringing them on and placing them, so overfilling in a sense, they're bringing them on, placing them in urgent care until they can start the cohort in, within the emergency department. So we're, you know, bringing them on, actually starting them, and then they get to work in another area. And once the cohort is ready to start, then they'll move them from urgent care into the emergency department. And then I guess my last question is, I know you've taken a lot of nurses are interested in making um, either lateral moves or different moves within the organization. So are we, in some of these instances, poaching people from one place to another, which might not be bad because maybe some floor nurses want to go to the next level and, and really enhance their skills. But how many of these folks that you're looking at in the pipeline are coming from outside? And I think we've asked this before, you know, compared to inside, so we we you know squeeze in one area and lose in another yeah so all of the ones that are reported in that section for are external hires meaning that they're from an eligible list and that was really our goal with the um the expedited hiring project that we took on in december was really to hire from external eligible lists because as you stated we do have per mou um, we give our internal rns the ability to reassign to another unit so that um, they do still have, you know, that option available to them, but that is opening another vacancy in another unit. And so our goal was really to try to fill from the external list. So we're, we're doing both simultaneously. We're hiring from, um, you know, reassignment candidates, and then we're also filling from the eligible lists. Thank you. And that's great news. That you're getting people from the outside. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the report. You're welcome. And uh, thank you, and, and I wanted to thank you for the uh, new charts in terms of the uh, various uh, uh, section uh, vacancy rates. Uh, they're very easy to read, very nice. Great. Uh, particularly like that the ED vacancy rate trend uh, looks good, right? <laughs> so. Yes, it will be changing um, soon because they had, again, some of those reassignment candidates were moving from their existing 0.9 positions to 0.6 positions, will, which will open up again our 0.9 positions, oh. and we'll be back to filling more vacancies. Okay. Well, anyway, it's very nice uh, and uh, very easy to read. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we'll go on to our next topic. Sure. Uh, item seven is the medical staff report. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my name is Gabe Ortiz, Chief of Medical Staff at ZSFG. Um, Happy New Year to, to all. Uh, first time seeing you all. Um, so I have the honor of presenting the uh, medicine and urology service reports, um, as well as their rules and regs. And so um, for the Department of Medicine service report, this is presented by Dr. Neil Poe. Um, Tremendous department, extremely large footprint, uh, encompassing 13 divisions, which are listed in the uh, minutes that were forwarded to you all, uh, totaling 888 faculty and staff. So quite a large department. Um, they're kind of, you can see they're kind of house multiple leadership positions, training, lead multiple training programs. Um, and uh, in terms of their budget and finances, uh, ins almost match the outs with kind of one thing that was highlighted kind of only 3% of the budget goes towards administration costs, which uh, to support such a large department, which is quite impressive. Um, in terms of the clinical services delivered um, and as alluded to by Dr. Ehrlich, the hospital is very busy and the Department of Medicine is uh, the largest kind of clinical service in the hospital. Um, the uh, medicine services and, and the medical ICU services um, care for a large major a large portion of the patients that come through our hospital doors. Um, and so they've been bearing the largest brunt of some of the census surge that we've been experiencing at the hospital. Within the department, we also have the beloved palliative care service, which is now back up and running, as well as our uh, tremendous ACT service. Um, 
uh, our Ward 86 uh, service, which kind of last year cel celebrated their 40th anniversary. And um, the Met Department of Medicine also staffs the Richard Fine People's Clinic on campus, uh, which delivers primary care to our, our, our pop patient population. Uh, the department also leads uh, in terms of specialty care and, and uh, in fiscal year 23, um, staffing 52,000 clinic visits for specialty care, uh, staffing e-consults with consult volumes growing up to 7, 000, from 7,000 up to 18,000 in the fiscal year 22-23, um, and occupational health uh, services is also delivered by this department. Um, in terms of performance improvement, just a tremendous amount of work. Uh, you can see attention being paid to the census surge, and so this department is innovating and trying to do things to be able to uh, care for the patient demands that we're seeing, including cohorting uh, the lower level of care patients onto one faculty service to try to deliver uh, more continuity for those patients and more consistency, as well as bring in residents, extra residents to assist with admitting when uh, the teams that are slated to be in-house get overwhelmed. Um, we kind of Going back to the heart failure work, uh, the cardiology divisions within the Department of Medicine, they've, this has been tremendous work that we're really proud of with readmission rates re being reduced from 33% at baseline down to 20%, which is just an astounding achievement. And the black Af African American disparity gap being closed with all the work that has been dedicated to this important project, uh, resulting as well on top of all the patient benefits resulting in $8 million um, saved in terms of uh, pay for performance funding. The uh, Richard Fine People's Clinic uh, has been doing lots of uh, really impressive improvement work as well, focusing on hypertension, diabetes, and screening for um, health screening for various uh, malignancies. Uh, they, their disparity gaps persist, but they've seen some improvements, and so there's work to be done yet uh, for, particularly for kind of malignancy screening within the patients in, in our RFPC um, area. Um, I'll jump to education uh, because the Department of Medicine trains a large number of residents and fellows. Um, the medical students, a third of them uh, rotate through uh, the Department of Medicine at ZSFG each year, so kind of a large contribution to uh, the medical staff, m medical student training. And then for, in terms of res residents, uh, 31 residents per month are based at the general for their, for their training um, uh, on the inpatient services with um, 50 uh, in continuity clinics and 10 clinical fellows on site. Uh, and then in terms of res the research enterprise, uh, the Department of Medicine has uh, $126 million in research funds um, spread across multiple divisions. And some of the top NIH recipients are based at, uh, within the Department of Medicine are based at the general, which is a great point of pride for us. Uh, lots of publications in 2022, 989 publications stemming from all the academic work being done. Um, and kind of rounding out, I think, what Dr. Poe summarized for the Med Exec Committee, um, really the census increase has been a challenge that kind of the, the department is striving to address. Um, in addition, space for ambulatory clinical operations, the kind of clinic volumes have gone up. Weariness, burnout, which kind of is a trend across uh, healthcare in general, particularly coming out of COVID and now seeing these census uh, demands on our teams. Um, generating data in a timely fashion, um, and then the move to Pride Hall and the high cost of living in the Bay Area, all kind of leading to challenges. And then their goals for the department uh, over the next year, kind of big focus on well-being. Uh, we had a faculty retreat uh, just a few months ago where lots of great uh, brainstorming was done to kind of to, to focus in on the well-being of the faculty and staff. Lots of innovation and improvement in the clinical care areas, which will certainly help in terms of faculty well-being. And then uh, focus on retaining the faculty on within the group. We have some really talented folks doing amazing things. Um, uh, advancing philanthropy and uh, improving communication collaboration um, across the department, kind of being some of the highlights in terms of the, the goals for the department. So quite a quite a, a stellar report for a very large department, um, and uh, and so we were.
kind of really just just pleased with kind of how much is being done. Um, the Department of Urology has also presented to the Medical Executive Committee since the last time uh, I presented. So Dr. Bain, who is our interim service chief, uh, gave quite a wonderful report uh, about their activities. So in terms of the urology scope of, of clinical, the clinical footprint for the Department of Urology, they staff a 24-7, 365 day a week attending. They staff uh, operating room uh, services, Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and a clinic uh, with uh, extra clinics having been added on to catch up with a backlog that they were experiencing, and they're kind of making progress there in terms of uh, meeting demands for outpatient services, urolo urologic outpatient services. Um, the uh, highlighted in, in this part of the report was the absence of robotic surgery, which is becoming more and more the standard of care uh, within urologic services. Um, and so that's something that kind of I'll circle back to in terms of challenges and goals for the department. Um, in terms of faculty and residents, um, a really wonderful quote was shared, which I wanted to share with you, which kind of they really hold as a mantra. Their, their residency program is the crown jewel of their department, which I thought was uh, kind of quite a nice quote and a nice thing that they hold close, near, and dear, and are very proud of. So they take pride in, in kind of the education of uh, urologic uh, residents. They have 55% female residents, 45% underrepresented uh, in medicine uh, residents, which is uh, quite great in terms of the field, but also in general compared to any uh, field, but particularly for urology. Um, and so they take a lot of pride in, in, in their, uh, in kind of being quite stellar and kind of experts in the training of, uh, uh, in, in urology. It's also noted that the urology faculty have the second lowest burnout rates uh, across UCSF faculty. And so, um, Kind of, we had a great discussion on what the secret sauce there was for maintaining that. Um, in terms of performance improvement, uh, the urology department has, is looking towards decreasing day of surgery cancellation rates. Um, they're also looking at AI and machine learning for improve, improving care, kind of a theme of, of the day. And so hopefully we can come back and share more about that to the committee. Um, and in terms of research, they rank quite high, they're the third highest uh, funding uh, in terms of NIH funding for urology department. So really kind of in tremendous in terms of what's being done across the urology department. Um, some of the work uh, that's being done may be of interest to the commissioners. They're looking at income as a major predictor for worse outcomes in, uh, for kidney stones, looking at challenges facing urologists on low and middle income countries and looking at training urologic surgeons in minimally invasive surgery in Guyana, um, as well as the application of technology to to face-to-face um, uh, -face learning that may exist, dealing with international borders, long distance, and travel. So kind of an interesting set of global, uh, globally-minded, as well as kind of equity-minded um, uh, work being done. They, they really kind of highlighted kind of in their, one of their strengths, just curiosity-driven research across their group. Um, in their financial report, um, uh, it was highlighted that kind of the, while RVUs declined during the pandemic, that's back up to their prior baselines in the last year. So they're kind of back on track. So to kind of uh, just to close out um, the strengths, the people, I mean, they just have a really great faculty group, uh, very cohesive group, a world-class department with kind of globally minded department as well, I would say. Um, focused on curiosity-driven research. Um, they really hold the residency and their kind of education as a pride and joy and their crown jewel, um, and their commitment to the community um, were all highlighted as strengths. Challenges uh, identified kind of their PI work, so day of sur uh, surgery cancellations is something uh, has been a challenge for them that they're looking forward to continue to address. Uh, increasing access, um, their attendings are spread across the multiple UC sites in addition to the general, and so that's kind of been a challenge just in terms of uh, the, the, that kind of divide. And space and equipment with kind of the key, um, one of their key goals, transitioning, uh, being trying to establish uh, or increasing access to robotic surgery, which right now is referred out. Um, and kind of, as mentioned, they have a, a great educational program teaching residents and staff how to do this, and so kind of uh, I think the, the service chief is looking to see, uh, looking for creative ways trying to bring that to the general. 
um, intelligent utilization of EHR data, um, kind of alluded to in some of the AI and machine learning projects, uh, kind of looking to stabilize their systoscopy could be sweet, um, continue their global urologic footprint, uh, looking to expand philanthropy and looking to recruit faculty who spe specialize in reconstructive surgery and robotic surgery, uh, as in addition to stone surgeries. So that was, those are the two service reports. Um, I'll quickly run through, there are multiple rules and regs here, kind of that are quite large. Um, I'll just kind of give some highlights and then stop for questions. Um, as promised, I'm bringing back the OBGYN rules and regs. Um, just as a reminder, uh, we removed fetal scalp monitoring from the OBGYN rules and regs. Uh, we changed tubal ligation to tubal sterilization throughout the document and removed laser conization, which is no longer done. So thank you for that input that was approved by our MEC is now being brought back for um, final approval by our, our health commissioners. Um, in terms of the Department of Medicine rules and regs, um, thank you so much for the questions. Um, I have reached out to Dr. Poe and we plan on updating some of the sections here based off of the feedback. So uh, with respect to privacy practices, um, we will add in addition to um, kind of stating that specified protected health information shall only be shared as required for job duties. We will add that um, when shared, it will be done in locations that protect patient privacy, so not in public spaces. Um, in terms of the second comment, uh, kind of we will change some of the grammatical uh, phrasing to, so that the document flows a little better. In terms of one of the specific questions around the overflow, admission overflow protocol and backup admitting guidelines, um, we'll add some consistency to the wording. This, this uh, specifically refers to uh, who is available in-house in case the first lines of admitting providers are capped or kind of, uh, kind of receive their complement of patient admissions during their shift. Who do those folks turn to as a second, third, and fourth backup, which are mainly teams that are already in-house. Uh, for example, our cardiolo cardiology team who's admitting side by side, or our family medicine teams kind of crossing departments um, or our medical ICU teams. And so um, we will uh, add consistency to that work verbiage to ensure that um, the admission overflow protocols and those backup admitting guidelines are one and the same and kind of linked together. Um, and then uh, as a I have to take as a follow-up item the last two questions, the organizational chart. There wasn't anything that I could find quickly with Dr. Poe's help, so I think he's putting something together for you. So I can be happy to forward that uh, to you. It is a large department, so I think an organizational tree would be very beneficial, not just uh, for the health commissioners. I think it would be helpful for us as well um, uh, at the hospital. And then uh, in terms of the um, what coverage from uh, medicine has been uh, garnered by the removal of the emergency department rotation, um, that question is still pending. Dr. Poe wasn't able to collect that from some of the residency leadership. So I'll have to take that as a follow-up item to kind of share with you. Um, and then last but not least are the OHNS standard, standardized procedures. And the key question here, so I bring these back because the Botox procedures were presented previously but hadn't gone through the vetting process. Uh, and so they have gone through that vetting process. And I think one of the questions that you had back when these were originally presented were um, the question around the anatomy textbook that's referenced. Um, the, Dr. Durr, the service chief, um, uh, highlights that the uh, anatomy text, um, the Bailey's otolaryngology anatomy text, and particularly this, the chapter on surgical anatomy of the head and neck is used quite uh, routinely for training purposes. And so that's the text, they still use a paper textbook that's maintained in their library for, um, for kind of teaching some of the privileges that are uh, brought today for your approval. And so that that is um, still accurate. And so kind of we're going to keep the, we can, um, I'll ask her in, in future uh, versions to potentially name the textbook specifically so it's clear. Um, that concludes my, uh, my report. Definitely open to comments or questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Green. Um, well, for, first, uh, let me ask if uh, in medicine you said that you accepted a, a, a fair number of the comments and would be revising that. Are, are you asking 
that we uh, re-look at this or uh, you're uh, feeling that this is uh, a more uh, verbiage and word changes, but that you're asking that we approve the current and then you're going to change it or uh, what I, do you ask? I'm, I'm, I'm requesting that because the uh, changes are relatively minor that I bring I, that we approve with the changes, and I can kind of bring those changes to, to Mark, um, kind of help put those changes in, but I'm requesting that we approve, uh, continue upon those changes being included, which are kind of uh, the, uh, the, the three changes being kind of the privacy statement that will include kind of not sharing PHI in public locations, um, the grammatical change attendance is expected at the following conferences to make it a, a, a sentence. Um, and then the third kind of uh, including or referencing referencing that admission overflow protocol um, where they reference backup admitters admitting policy. Uh, so that kind of that's one in the same uh, in the two sec two places where those are referenced within the rules and rights. Okay, so. so uh, I, I guess, Mark, uh, since we will be accepting and recommending and it will then go to the commission, these things should be then ready for the commission. W what do you think? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a meeting on February 6th. Um, Dr. Ortiz, is it realistic to have the things you're talking about, the revision to me by then, so that they, when they vote as a whole, that they're voting on the final? Yeah, I can have these uh, with it by the end of the week for, for circulation. Great. That's great. Did you hear that, Dr. Chow? Uh, yes, and then okay. and then uh, the questions that uh, uh, Dr. Poe are still working on, including uh, what is the emergency coverage now and so forth, uh, would be helpful also to understand why we were removing the resident from the emergency room. Yeah, I can get those answers as well, and I'll circulate that via email rather than kind of within the rules and regs. Okay. Sure. And just for you to know, um, this is very common at Laguna Honda, so this process to approve with contingent on responses comes at Laguna often. And um, if you can't get it by the end of the week, just let me know and then we'll track it to make sure the next week we'll Perfect. get it. All right. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Green. Well, well, first of all, thank you for letting us nitpick these things. <laughs> it's actually very helpful for just in terms of having additional eyes because these are such long documents um and it often helps enhance what we're submitting so thank you for thank, thanks so much and you know I, I just have to say it is always inspiring to hear about these various departments at the county not only by virtue of the scope and breadth of the work but the incredible accomplishments especially the department of medicine um many departments don't hold a candle to what you're doing and it's it's just incredibly laudable and i hope you'll communicate that with all of these remarkable people that work in the department i also um on the urology side um uh i also have a patient who had one and a half babies during the um during the time she was a resident in the department of urology and i can absolutely attest having had i don't know 25 visits with her during this ten the tenure that she felt incredibly supportive that it was a very excellent training program and I believe she's going to stick around but she she really every time you know even though the work was hard and the hours were long she had the best things to say about the training and about the department and about the leadership so so I'm I I can say I'm, I'm very impressed that I can see why it would be the crown jewel so thank you well, thank you Commissioner Green I, I'm I look forward to bringing that back both to <laughs> Dr. Poe as well as to Dr. Bain. Uh, thank you so much for those comments. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Green, are you satisfied with the changes then on OB? Yes, indeed. Okay. And, and I also would like to uh, give my compliments to both of the service chiefs and particularly Dr. Poe's uh, presentation of, I didn't realize what a very large and complex department that we had here which is, uh, well, well, of course it is. It's a teaching hospital, I'm worthy of that. But uh, to, to have a county hospital have such a complexity of services and also then to have uh, such a very high percentage of the research that the university actually gains from grants and all, I, I think that again speaks well to the partnership between the city and UC. So. Uh, Thank you uh, very much, and uh, it, it's far, hard to say more. Not sure I 
gone through the residency as you've uh, outlined here. So uh, uh, they got to be great doctors coming out. So thank you, Dr. Chow. Thank you very much. Um, so, so commissioners, um, I think we need motions to to consider a recommendation to the full commission. Yes. Uh, is there a move? To recommend and knowing that the minor corrections will come back and will be part of the presentation to the commission as a whole. And I would second that. All right, Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this issue? Uh, yes. And Commissioner Green? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on to item eight, other business. Hearing none, um, we can go to item nine, public comment. Is there anybody in the room? All right, there's nobody in the room and because uh, let them, actually let me read this again so you all can hear effective January 16th 2024 members of the public attending the meeting may address the Commission through public comments made in person or in writing remote public comment is available only to those requiring accommodation due to a disability who cannot attend in person to request accommodation contact me the secretary by 12 noon the day before the Commission meeting for future meetings um, so we can move on to a consideration for a closed session. Okay, so we will need a motion for a uh, consideration of a closed session. So moved. And I would second. All right, how do you vote on this issue, Commissioner yeah. Chow? Yes. How do you vote? You vote on the. Yes. Okay, great. Um, folks who might be watching, um, we will go into a closed session. You will not see or hear us while we're in the remote closed session. Could someone please actually close the, the back door if you wouldn't mind? Thank you. Um, but we will be back after if you'd like to wait. And everybody else, please give me 30 seconds to move us over. Into open session. Commissioners, please consider a motion to uh, dis uh, disclose or not disclose discussions held in closed session. Move not to disclose. And I would second that. Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this issue? Yes. And Commissioner Green? Yes. Great. And now there's a the last action is a consideration for adjournment. Move to adjourn. And I would second that. Commissioner Chow, how do you vote on this issue? Yes. And Commissioner Green? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.